and Lou are legends in the lore. Woohoo! Yeah. Take two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are the bats. So because it's Friday the 13th, we need to ward off a few superstitions. So the first thing I want you to do is put your knuckles up. I want you to tap a piece of wood three times. <laughs> Salt. Salt? Did you, just, you just dropped it. <laughs> no! After you get your salt, throw it over your left shoulder. Hold up your peppermint. We are christening this new tour in Lula. Every time I start a new ghost tour, which I've done it one, two. This is the third tour I've started in my lifetime. Norcross, Sonoy, and now here in Lula. We have to christen with a peppermint patty. Long story short, the last tour my mother ever took with me, at the end of the tour, she couldn't find a peppermint patty and it was quite the thing. So from now on, we never start a tour without a peppermint patty. So it was to mom. To mom. To the legend's lore. And since this, this is, is a great grassy place, if you're young enough or flexible enough, I'd like you to reach down and touch your hand on the bare ground while we talk about the Native American Indian. So all in this place, in this piece of dirt, which is now Georgia, and Tennessee and South Carolina and Alabama and La Florida, Florida. This was all inhabited by the Creek, the Cherokee and the Oconee Native American Indians. I have a psychic friend who is the real deal. Her name is Reese Christian. And she said, when you talk about the natives, if you hold your hand on the earth, you might actually feel the earth's heartbeat because the natives were so connected to the earth to the environment, to nature. So much so, well, and, and why you would say, so think about this in a timeline. Oh, we got something? In a timeline of life, the Native Americans held this land for 12,000 years. Take a moment to let that sink in. But they were here for 12,000 years. And Andrew Jackson managed to run them out in 40 short years. So when the Creek were first encountered with the early explorers, those were the Spanish. The Spanish made their way to North Georgia and encountered the Creek Indians. And one of the things that they told the Spanish explorers about was gold. There's gold in them there hills. And we know that not far from here in Dahlonega, Georgia, was the first gold rush uh, in the United States of America. It's not far from here. So when they told these explorers about the gold, now that was a bit of a mistake. They were very trusting. And that brought people here, and that ended up, and who was in their way of making money off the gold? Uh, the Creek and the Native Americans. And then Andrew Jackson, he thought Georgia was a very right place for growing cotton, and the Creek were in the way of that as well. And so they shifted them out along the Trail of Tears, a very sad and bleak part of our American history. And this would have been in around the 18, 19, 1820s. And then there was the land lottery of the 1830s and 1840s. If you were a white European man, you could put your name in to get land drawn out of this lottery. Couldn't be African American, of course. Couldn't be a woman, of course, that wouldn't count. You had to be a white European settler and you would get these mass expanses of land. And that is how we now have Georgia, Tennessee, and South Carolina. So we are going to start off down the alley. We had our bats. We've warded off any superstitious activity. And we are ready to roll. So it was built in the late 1800s, and it was Adams and Sons. And we actually have a relative of one of the Adams. Jim's going to raise his hand. And one of the things that the children remember about the old mercantile was that you could get a 10 cent paper bag full of candy, penny candy. Kids don't understand that anymore. Penny candy, what's that? <laughs> and of course, Jim being a relative of the family who owned the shop, his little 10 cent bag usually had more like 20 or 30 cents worth of candy from what I've been told. That's what I'm telling you now. So we will end up back here at the mercantile in a few minutes, but we're going to talk about the beginning of Lula in just a minute, but I do want to go back to the Creek Nation for a minute. Now, the Creek, and you're getting a history lesson, sorry. 
the creek were attracted to this area of Georgia because where you're standing right now, did you know that you were on the Eastern Continental Divide? You were literally, he knows. <laughs> we are on the Eastern Continental Divide. What does that mean? Well, on this side, when it rains, all that rainwater heads to the Gulf of Mexico. On this side, when it rains, all that water goes to the Atlantic Ocean. What? Crazy. <laughs> and when we get down to the end of this little alley, there is the headwaters of the Chattahoochee River and the headwaters of the Oconee River right here in what is now Lula. So the natives, over 12,000 years, of course, they started telling tales. Where are the waterways? Where are the natural ridge lines? Stone Mountain, they thought was very sacred. Who is this, you know, stone that just, of granite that just protrudes from the earth. Uh, where I'm from in Warm Springs, Georgia, they thought, why is, this, why is the water so warm? This must be sacred. So the Indians knew over time of all of these areas. Now, they ran trails along this natural ridge line. Then, when the settlers started coming in, they were making, turning those trails into roads. And then what happened? The railroad came in and they followed these same trails. But we're not gonna talk about the railroad too much just now. We're gonna wait till we're over on the other side of the tracks. And hopefully we'll have a big train go through tonight. That would be great. <laughs> so we're talking about this natural ridge line. This is one of the reasons the Indians thought this area was very sacred. Now, next door to the mercantile. Hey, Dave. Next door to the Mercantile, you would have had the Masonic Lodge, and then in the building next to that, there was an interesting secret sanctum. Upstairs, a group of gentlemen would gather. And they were known as the Society of Odd Fellows. All right. Odd Fellows were similar to the Masonic Lodge. Now, the Freemasons, very old group of people and of course we know Sherman was a Freemason and if you had the Mason apron on your home when he made his charge to the sea uh, he'd take all your pigs and all your food and all of that but he would leave your house he wouldn't burn your house to the ground if he knew you were a Freemason uh, so there was some respect there but what about the odd fellows the odd fellows actually outnumbered the Freemasons here in Georgia And they were a group of people. Now, in those days, if you were having trouble at work or someone passed away and you were struggling with money or food, you, you know, you couldn't just file something with the government and get some food stamps or, or go get Social Security. None of that existed. So this group of men and businessmen, they were uh, philanthropic and they were community-minded. But they had some interesting practices that they would do upstairs to the left in that building. And Dave of the Mercantile, well, when he first moved into the shop, he, he heard a rumor. He heard a rumor that there was a casket somewhere upstairs in this building. Why would they have a casket? Well, part of your initiation into the Odd Fellows was to face death head on. And part of your initiation would be to leave left in a room, um, a lot of times with a real skeletal remains of a real human <laughs> to face death head on they believed if you face death head on you would emerge from that experience with a better understanding of life and how to care for others so this was their experience and they carried all that out of there now david heard that there was a casket up there and he wasn't sure if that was true or not but he he kind of jokingly went down when they were remodeling and said, hey, you know, y'all you, you found a casket up there? <laughs> and they said, no, we haven't. The very next day, the folks who were remodeling came down, spoke to Dave Wilson and said, um, about that casket. <laughs> we found it. And indeed, they found a casket upstairs in this building that is being remodeled. Now, it wasn't a full casket, it was more child size. And it was something different about this casket as well. Right where your face is was a glass window pane. You see, this was a summer casket. Because in the summertime, we had to bury you quickly because we didn't want to smell you. 
this was before embalming. Embalming really didn't become popular until around the 1900s. We wanted to see you and wish you off, but we didn't want to smell you. <laughs> so they would put the bodies in these caskets with these window panes in front of them, and then we would bury you very quickly. Now, I won't get too much into burials. I've got a grave digger to do that in a few minutes, and he'll fill you in on some details of the history of burials and funerals, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But upstairs in that sanctum, in that secret sanctum, these odd fellows would carry out these what we would consider odd habits now. And it was basically to face death head on to become a better person in life. And perhaps we could all still benefit from that lesson. And Looking for energy, not now it's okay, it's a stud finder, we all know what it is. It's finding electrical studs and so forth. But there's no electricity right here. So go figure. when we pushed the natives westward. An interesting thing, and again, it's hard to wrap your head around some of this history because we're so wrapped up in the now that we don't think about how it was before. Where we are now was considered a westward expansion by settlers. Uh oh, careful, that's, like, that's right, glaring I'm a little bit for folks. This was a westward expansion. In North Georgia, we see the whole United States, and that's hard to believe, but it is true. Where were they coming from? A lot were coming from North Carolina and also the coastline. And it's important to remember one of the things people liked about North Georgia was the clear mountain air. Because in those days, we really didn't have good medicine or a good grasp on science. So if people were getting sick along the coastline, we thought, well, we got to get out. It's got to be in the air. So let's go northward where the air is a little clearer. Now, what was in the way? The Native American Indians. When they were pushed away on the Trail of Tears, some of them hoped and believed that they would return to what was their, really their God-given homeland. But of course, many did not. But what they would do to mark their way back, would they would take a very young tender tree and they would bend it down the sapling and use some sinew from a deer leg, like ligaments and tendons, and they would tie it down and gently bend the tree into an elbow. And these are called Native American bent tree marker trees. Uh, some people don't believe them, but Native Americans have said that they are a true thing. Where do they point to? Sources of water, burial grounds. We're not far from a burial mounds here over by uh, Helen, so that's kind of a neat thing. Uh, they might point to a warm spring. They might point to something. There are four bent trees all around Stone Mountain. Where do they point to? The top of the mountain. Every last And if you would look from the top, they're like, it, it's incredible that these Native Americans could do this without any kind of GPS or topographical stuff. It's really amazing stuff. There are still bent trees in the United States of America, but they are a living, historical memorial that is dying because trees are alive and eventually they will die. Uh, over where I live near FDR State Park, we just lost one in January. Uh, it was really sad to see it come down. So if you ever see a tree with a very pronounced elbow or nose as it's known, that possibly is a natural living piece of history that it'll be gone one day can't preserve them forever. So that's an interesting part of history. Now, I knew a gentleman who lived along the Trail of Tears. He had a farm that was along the Trail of Tears. But he had a problem because he had a shed, a little barn on his property. And when he first moved there, the barn door would keep getting open. He closed it back up, couldn't figure out why, how this door kept getting open. <clears throat> well, 
Finally, he had a friend come over who considered herself sort of an empath, a bit of a psychic. And she said, well, that barn is literally along the trail where these natives were marched westward. They were sick, they were dying, they were scared. Uh, all of these horrible things were happening to them and they are continually in a loop circling your property and going through that barn door. So they keep opening it over and over and over again. And that's a natural phenomenon we talked about the paranormal, a loop. A loop of paranormal experience is when there's something so traumatic that the spirit is stuck in that traumatic experience. Marching westward away from your native homeland would certainly qualify as a traumatic experience. And so we're going to talk about those loops. Now, as you're taking pictures, try not to focus, just snap a lot of pictures. But later, maybe you see an orb. The orb is a glowing light over your head. And if you have your flashlight on, I will show you a very pronounced image of an orb. Do you have a flashlight? Turn on your flashlight. Over my head is an orb. This was daytime. Wow. This is the type of thing you're going to look for in your photographs. This particular photograph, um, you know, you might have some memory of seeing this. This was featured on the front page of the Atlanta Journal Constitution in 2012. Oh, wow. the north, isn't that so cool? Now, if you've uh, started watching our YouTube channel, Miss Marie was on my last video and she had an orb over her face when she was telling a story about her mother at her mother's funeral. Uh, so you, you just, you can't predict them. You don't see them really in the moment. This is the type of thing you're looking for. Now, this is an orange one. <clears throat> so it has, we're nothing to fear from that. Uh, if you see a red orb, uh, I'll run. Uh, uh, Natalie and Dave have a vortex at the mercantile, and I keep telling them to stay away from that. But, uh, What's a know? vortex? A vortex is an opening to the other world, to the spiritual realm. But we want you to stay on this, this side, side of it for as long as possible, my dear. <laughs> hey, well, he just wasn't ready to leave yet, was he? No, it was right by the street where he grew up. You're kidding me. Oh, I just got chills. Did you hear that? Do you want to share that? So, get your name again, dear? Diane. Diane has a picture. She'll show you guys at the end of the tour. Um, I'm not even sure if that qualifies an orb or more of an apparition because it looks almost like a fog. It was from the back of your husband's. When my husband passed away, it was from his funeral. So right next to the hearses, it's driving by the street where he grew up on. There's this orb right next to the hearse. Incredible. Yeah. And when you're when you're freshly deceased, like in you know Beetlejuice, the freshly yeah. dead, uh, that your energy is a little bit more prominent to linger. So that does make sense before you cross over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't see it. My daughter took no. the picture and you wouldn't it, see it in person. No, she no. took the picture and just yeah. I'm sure she did. I, yeah. I yeah, I would have. Yeah. Well, he was just telling you that maybe he was just going to linger on his little home street. Yep. Wow, that's crazy. You saw a black cat? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> we about to go inside the old jail. The that old jail. jail. <laughs> so before we go in, this downstairs is the old jail of Lula and Belton, and we'll talk about the two towns here in a little while. Upstairs was the courthouse. One of the judges in your town was Judge Luke Thompson. And instead of a gavel, he used the butt of his pistol to call in court. Okay, you can imagine up there. Rrr, rrr. And that's why we say the early days of Lula, it was much like the Wild West. Every gentleman carried a sidearm. That's just the way it was.
the part of the tour that I explain to you what on earth is a little old grandma doing out in the middle of the night talking to strangers on the street. <laughs> in 2008, the city of Norcross, Georgia, realized that the businesses in October were, pardon the expression, dead. And the city council said, Stone Mountain's not dead in October. Roswell's not dead in October. What do they have? They have a ghost tour. And with a ghost tour, you come and you eat, and you shop, and you do all the fun things. So there was a Norcross ghost tour that started. Well, I wasn't involved in the first year, but I took the tour. And the ghost guide was pretty good. She was interesting. She used some names from our town, but she didn't know any real stories. I said, so where'd you get the name? She goes, oh, off the tombstones. <laughs> That's a good place, I guess. So we collaborated because at that same time, Arcadia, the history press, had uh, acquisitioned me to write a book called Remembering Norcross, Nuggets of Nostalgia. And I was learning all the history of Norcross at the very same time. Now, I considered myself a debunker. Debunker means I didn't believe in ghosts. Okay, I didn't believe in any of this paranormal mishmash, wishwash. However, when you throw yourself into this line of work, things happen. <laughs> like, you type up a whole document and you send it to a friend and say, hey, would you look this over and edit it? And they send it back and say, whoop, there's nothing on this document. What did you send me? And they send you back a blank document that you spent like hours working on. Very, so always back up your work when you're in the paranormal realms. Lesson number one. Uh, and we got involved with the Norcross Ghost Store. It was very popular for several years and I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, then, over time, we decided to move to sunny Florida. So we did move to Florida and then at that point, I was touring with Ripley's, <laughs> believe it or not, the Ghost Train Adventure. Then I started doing a walking tour with the original ghost tour of St. Augustine, Tour St. Augustine. Um, so I was literally guiding people through the oldest continually occupied town in the whole United States. We would walk along the bayfront. I would hear the ocean lapping up. It was amazing. It was an amazing uh, six years working there. Then my kids all decided to have children of their own. And when COVID hit, I had eight grand reasons to come back to Georgia, if you know what I mean. And we returned to Georgia. And at that very same time, because of COVID, I was really bored with nothing on TV. And my husband found a really cool show on Netflix called The Walking oh, yeah. Dead. And then my daughter-in-law sent me a message and said, hey, they're hiring tour guides for The Walking Dead. And for two years, I was a tour guide in Sonoy for The Walking Dead. Any Walking Dead fans? You. We, I, I know you are. <laughs> Tomorrow night, actually, that. even if you're not no. on the tour, if uh -oh. you want to stop Good by job. at 7, we have two hero walkers going to show up and talk all things Walking Dead with us. Sonia, well, I've got favorite a lot, moment? A lot of different ones uh, that were my favorite on set because I worked two seasons and stuff. But uh, the very first day of filming The Walking Dead with walkers, with zombies, was down in Fairburn, Georgia. And I got to actually witness little girl zombie, the one with the teddy bear. Oh, the slippers. Shot by Rick, real yeah. time, right there. Yeah. Wow. And I remember us looking out Classic. and uh, we, were, it was, we were in the convenience store and we were all kind of like peeking out like this. There was only about maybe eight, maybe 10 of us. I don't know, there wasn't many of us. They just brought all the heroes in for, the, for that particular shot. Um, we we're looking out and Frank Darabont says, cut, cut, we can see the zombies. <laughs> yeah, do this over. Do it so, over. Yeah, have so fun. we did have that, fun. but, uh, but he's fun. right. The Scalero um, um, eye contacts, you can't see very well with those in. They're full on Scaleros. And, uh, you know, the makeup process takes an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes longer, depending on how long, you know, what they're wanting to do to you that right. day. Right, right. Um, it's uh, have to get out of it. Yeah, and oh, then yeah. another, yeah, and then another 45 right. minutes to two hours to get out of it because they would have to, like, take a brush with alcohol and just slowly peel it away because it was all glued to your face. Mm. So it Crazy. was a, I call that zombie spa. 
<laughs> I took a hot towel and laid it on her face, and we let it, you know, like it all, you know, it was nice. And uh, after a long day, 12, what well, was actually 16 hour days. Yeah, yeah, um, mm -hmm. It was long days. So long. Um, and uh, so, so basically, then they take some other stuff and put it on your face and stuff. And you're just like, okay, okay, I'm ready to get out of this, you know. But, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of cool things that that, uh, that happened on set. And uh, Irony Singleton, who he, you know, took out as T Dog. He's, he's a great guy, you know, I, I worked with him on some uh, TV shows, on uh, the TV show uh, Somebody's before The Walking Dead, so it was good to work with him again and, and do that. And um, everybody's like one big family there, mm -hmm. uh, Chandler Riggs and, and Andrew Lincoln, all of them, Norman Reedus, they're all great. And, you know, I couldn't have asked for any better show to have been on, and I'm very thankful for it. Out of all the, all, out of all the work and stuff I've done, I have to say it's one of my favorites. Wonderful. Well, that's how things all started. Now, in the early days, like I said, I was a debunker. And I really wasn't even scared of Friday the 13th until one night. <laughs> My mistake. And by the way, did you know that October 13th happened 25 years ago today and 45 years ago today? I know this because two of my guests tomorrow are celebrating their birthday today, but they're going tomorrow night on the tour. One's turning 25 and one turning 45. I was like, ooh, gotta look this up. Interesting. And numbers and numerology are an interesting thing. So with this whole Friga Triscodecophobia, the fear of Friday the 13th, how did that happen to me? Well, I'll tell you. One evening, Friday the 13th, I believe it was August of 08, I believe, we said, oh, there's a Friday the 13th. Let's do a little paranormal hunt. This could be fun. <laughs> We're going around and people are getting evidence, people are having a lot of fun, and we get to one spot on the tour where we knew a little boy named Billy passed away. He was struck while riding his bike in the street, and his spirit lingered underneath this one house. The psychics had talked to him before. So on that evening with all the folks out like you are tonight, we called out to Billy. Billy, if you hear us, send us a sign. Billy, if you're here, let us know. And at that very moment, two gentlemen in the crowd had their cell phones go off. They each got five text messages. That's kind of cool because Billy was five when he was killed. Billy. Second cool part gives me the goosebumps to this day. Both of these gentlemen were named William. The only two gentlemen in the crowd that received the five text messages were William. And William, of course, would have been Billy's name. So that's when we started being a little bit fearful of Friday the 13th. Before. Now, I want to tell you about a little bit about Lula. We know that Lula was started in 1873 because of the railroad, which is right behind us. A train could come by right now. That'd be nice. <laughs> so the Richmond, after the Civil War, a period of time called Reconstruction happened. And this was to rebuild the economy of the South. And what better way than to rebuild it with the railroad? Because we needed to move cotton, we needed to move cattle, we needed an economy to come back. The Richmond Danville Railroad line you see behind me started in what is now Atlanta, which was first called Marthasville, and then Terminus, my Walking Dead fans, Terminus, same place. And it worked its way first to Norcross, 20 miles north of Atlanta. 1871, Norcross sprang up because of the railroad. It slowly worked its way up to Lula, where we are now, and then north of here was Belton. 1873, the railroad made it here. This rail line goes all the way from Atlanta to Washington, D.C. now. So this is your route to Washington, D.C. This is how Lula and Belton came to be all because of the railroad. Now, railroads, trains are very dangerous. You don't want to get near them or you might be visiting Mr. Jim. You might be digging your grave next if you get too close to the railroad. Now, not far from here is a home that was the home of the Terrell family. They lived right on the tracks. Well, young Thomas Terrell had been told over and over and over it. His name was Thomas Gray, so they called him TR. He'd been told over and over by his mother, stay away from the tracks, stay away from the tracks. She punished him, but a young boy was attracted to the railroad for lots of reasons. 
One was you could maybe pick up coal that had fallen out of the train. That's kind of neat. You might find something that broke off of the, the train and you could pick it up and save it. And he kept going back to the tracks. And also, these young boys would pick up the train here. They thought it was a kick to jump on the train and ride it into downtown Lula. Not a very safe thing to do, but they did it just the same. Well, he got down to the tracks one day, even though his mother told him to stay away. And unfortunately, and now I have to tell you, this house, I slept there last night. And about 11 o'clock, I started thinking about young TR and the alarm talk clock started going brrrr. I was like, okay, get that out of my head. I'm moving to a different room. But that part of the tracks, the train whistle doesn't blow. They blow for crossings, they blow for deer. But that section, they don't blow the horns. And as he was jumping on, we believe he just missed and his leg got caught. The train ran over him. He was mortally wounded by the train, not but maybe a mile and a half down the tracks this way. His friends dragged him to his home on the other side of the tracks, the Terrell house. He resisted. He knew he wasn't gonna make it. He got up to the porch. They were trying to bring him into the house. And as they got him to the porch and up to the front door, he slammed his hands on either side of the door frame. He said, no, don't take me inside. He didn't want his mother to see him pass. He slammed his bloody handprints on either side of that door frame and he passed away on the front porch. Poor little Terrell. A month later, his father Simon passed away from unknown reasons. Grief, perhaps. For months, years, they scrubbed. They washed with bleach, they painted over, they could not remove those bloody handprints from either side of the door of the Terrell Is that the horse thing? So, pardon? Is it the horse family that lives there now? No, it's the Greer family that lives there now. Oh, the Greer family. okay. Yeah. So children, when mother says, stay away from the tracks, mind your manners, you don't want to end up in Mr. Jim's hands. Because what did you do today, Jim? This time, I just did the largest grave I have ever done. And it takes us to a legend that took place right here in Lula. Back in the early 1900s, there was a Lula resident here by the name of James Finch. Now, James Finch was known in the circus world as the fattest man on earth. Now, in this day and age, that really doesn't apply to calling somebody. Now, Mr. Finch, however, had a different outlook on life, and he embraced the fattest man on earth, and he made a living for himself traveling around the United States with circuses. Now, during the winter times, I don't know if you're all aware of this, but circuses went to Florida. Okay, they came out of the north, and they went to Florida, and they spent the winter in the Florida. Now, James didn't like to spend the winters in Florida, so he would stay up north. And the way he supported himself staying up north, New York City, for the most part, would be restaurants would pay him being so large to sit out in front of their restaurants, eating their food, in the hopes of enticing customers to come in and enjoy wow. their wares. <laughs> Now, as I said, James was from here, uh, actually in Belton, when it was two separate towns back in the day. Uh, I don't know if you told this part, did you? Mm. How they became one? No. Okay. Feel Belton free. and Lula became one town in the 1950s during a drought. And to conserve water, they became one institution. Now, he grew up here uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, he was raised by his mother, Rose, and his stepfather, Henry Whitaker. And obviously at an early age he was very large and he used to actually take the local children on his back on the pond and float them across the pond to help them so he james had a very jovial jovial personality now the only problem with james he was a poor black man in the south in the 1900s early 1900s and he couldn't afford a pair of shoes now james had a size 17 shoe. Okay? And to put that in perspective, I am nearly 60 years old, and I know one person who had a size 17 quadruple E shoe. 
Now, in the 1990s, he had to have shoes custom made for him because his feet were so large. Now, what can you imagine in the early 1900s what a poor black kid would do in the South for shoes with that size feet? Well, James came up with an ingenious idea. He took the used tires from Model T's and cut the tires up and strapped them to his feet. Because uh -huh. the last place you want to be walking around without shoes is Georgia in the summer. Anybody that's ever been bitten by a red ant knows that, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, eventually, as James became well known from traveling with the circuses, uh, the Bona Allen Leather Company down in Buford took it upon themselves to actually make them, uh, make James a size 17 leather shoe uh, on the house for him. Nice. Now, they were famous for having made the largest shoe up until that time in history, which was a size 300 shoe. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Probably <laughs> for, you know, a show or a World's Fair or something like along those lines. We haven't really been able to yes. find that. Yes. Now, the interesting thing is, how would a young black man in the South come to join the circus? Okay. Well, obviously his options were limited at the time because the South was still very much segregated until the 1960s. So, <clears throat> rumor has it that the circus came to town and they had a couple elephants in the circus. And one of the elephants was an eagle. Okay. Now, I don't know if you all know True this, story. but elephant mating takes approximately two weeks, believe it or not. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, they couldn't get the elephants to move. All right? Now, <laughs> what they did was they built an enclosure and left a caregiver with the elephants while the elephants were mating. And what we understand, the rumor is, is that James joined the circus at that time when the elephants were being care of. Um, so, interesting story. Now, when James died, and he died as a young man, as you can imagine, uh, an 800 pound man uh, carrying that kind of weight around, his heart gave out in an early age. Sometime in his 25, I believe. 25 oh, or so my. years old. Now, James was so well known and so well loved here in the area that when he passed, and we believe he passed in either New York or Ohio, so his body had to be brought back home uh, by the train. Right across, right up the street here. Now, when the train was coming into town, local residents lined the tracks for miles to welcome James home on his final return. Now, he was buried. Uh, he was uh, the funeral was at the Springfield Baptist Church, and James's coffin was the size of a grand piano. Okay, and to get the coffin into the church, they had to take the doors off the church to get the coffin in. That's why I was joking that when I was digging the grave, it was the largest grave I've ever had to dig in my life. All right, we're going to talk about this memorial marker. We can't make it to the cemetery or any graveyard tonight. It's just too far to go. Now, that is a goal we have. If we continue to do Lula Legends and Lore in the future, we would hope to maybe be able to shovel you to one of the cemeteries. That's one of our goals, big goals, big goals we're going to do. Wouldn't it be cool? It'd be super cool. But in the meantime, we'll use this as a, a sort of pretend we're at the cemetery. But this is a memorial marker. Now, when we talked about Lula being a body little town, reminiscent of the Old West, we meant what we said. There were a lot of gunfights, there were a lot of shootouts. And unfortunately, in this God. case, lawmen were involved and here's how this story started a young girl went into mr leaf's shop and she broke a fountain pen now for you young kids there's a pen and there's like ink in it and you write on paper you don't tap out and you don't you, anyway <laughs> so there was a fountain pen and it was full of ink and she broke the fountain pen and the shopkeeper was very distressed because, you know, there's a tight profit margin when you run a little shop. Right, Miss Natalie? Tight profit margins at a little shop. <laughs> so, he told the little girl to go home and get her father. His name was Robert Hope. Bob Hope, if you will, but not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And they don't know who that is either. So. <laughs> Bob Hope was a guy. So she went home and told her father, Mr. Hope, that she was in a little trouble at the shop that was owned by Mr. Lee and said, I, I, he, he said, I broke a pen, daddy. 
and that you have to pay for it. But I didn't, you know, kids, so I didn't do it. I didn't break that pen. He, he's, he's making it up. And that worked up Bob Hope. He was very upset at this point. He thought that someone was accusing his darling little child who would never do anything wrong. <laughs> you know, children, they're perfect. And he got very angry with the shopkeeper. And he went back to the shopkeeper and he told him, my daughter did not uh, break your back a pen. How dare you accuse my daughter of breaking a pen? The shopkeeper, I saw her break the pen. It's worth X amount of money and you need to pay. And they started back and forth and it became a very heated argument. shop and we're going to arrest Mr. Hope. The deputy said, we're here to take you in. We'll settle this matter in court. Well, Mr. Hope was not going to have any of that. And in those days, a lot of the gentlemen, like my grave digger, had very long black jackets. And as he was arguing with the sheriff, the sheriff saw his jacket open and he believed that Mr. Hope was reaching for his sidearm. In response to that, the sheriff fired a shot, but he didn't shoot Mr. Hope. He shot his own deputy. Oh, he shot his own deputy, Jack Bryan. He shot the deputy, and in response, Mr. Hope shot back and killed the sheriff. Uh-oh. Did I remember that song? That's another one they don't understand. He shot the sheriff. The sheriff and the deputy both lay dead in the shop, and okay, that was a quite an uproar. Mr. Hope was brought to court, and the court was right here. And you can even read this whole story. They have a note of it here in the building, and that's why they memorialize these two gentlemen. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the stone, you'll notice this was exactly 100 years ago, in 1923, 100 years ago. He brought him to court. Mr. Hope pleaded self-defense. Killed two lawmen, pleaded self-defense. Well, there weren't any witnesses left to, because killed them all. <laughs> they were all dead. Uh, that's one way to get rid of witnesses, right? And the judge said, I believe this was self-defense. You get a year and a day. A year and a day for taking off two law enforcement officers. Not really a fair deal, but that's how it was in those days. And this is the memorial of those two lawmen killed right here in Lula, self-defense. And we're going to head down the sidewalk this way. 100 years ago wow. this year. Like a drop in the bucket of time. 